All right, welcome back for uh, Ezra chapter 5 and 6 as we go through session 3 of our Ezra and Nehemiah study together. Uh, glad you came back. Glad you're watching and enjoying that. It's your first time watching. Uh, you don't have access to the study guides, feel free to email me, uh, abecker at sjlarnold.org, and I'd love to get you on that list to get you those study guides. Um, if you had any questions, you can email me at that same uh, address as well, and I'd love to dialogue with you and connect with you. Uh, let's go ahead and begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for today, uh, for the blessings that you give. Uh, just as we study your word, Lord, uh, may you just uh, remind us of your love, your faithfulness, and your mercy. Just uh, fill our hearts with your spirit and knowledge of, of who you are. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so uh, let's dive in here. Um, so um, you might think about uh, ongoing projects that uh, you haven't completed. I, I know I have a, a to-do list, and and I know there are some of those uh, things on the to list to get transferred over to the new list because I didn't get to them. And that happens, I think, professionally to me as well as personally. So maybe there's something that, that you're thinking of, like, oh, that, that thing that's perpetually on your to-do list because you just can't seem to get it done. Um, last week, um, though, we talked about uh, some major themes in Ezra chapter 3 through 6. Uh, we went through the first part of that last week, uh, but I'll just highlight those again. We saw some of this. Uh, already going on last week. We see the, the continuity of worship uh, that's resumed in Jerusalem. So um, the altar is built and they begin to offer the daily sacrifices. They have all of the feasts and festivals that they're able to have. They, they begin to do those things and so that they're trying to faithfully uh, do pre-exilic worship there. So there's the, what they were doing before they're doing again. Uh, so they're not doing a new thing. It's just been interrupted uh, by the exile. Uh, you see the authority of the written documents in these sections, especially the teachings of Moses are highlighted in the midst of this section. Uh, and then you see the opposition of surrounding unbelievers. Uh, but through it all, you see God's providence, his gracious action to save his people. Uh, so one thing you can see is God keeps his promises. That's what uh, we as readers of Ezra can see here uh, as we look at these themes. God keeps his promises. So with that being said, uh, go ahead, read Ezra chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. All right. Uh, so as we look at that, uh, we see who encourages the returned exiles uh, that are there in the midst of that. We see that it's the, the prophets Haggai and Zechariah. Um, so these are um, the second and third last prophets, uh, books of the Bible, you would say, in the Old Testament. And, and they're the ones that preach during this time of the rebuilding of the temple. They're the ones that get that temple restarted. I'd been kind of sitting idle for about 12 years or so with nothing being done. Uh, and they get that started. So uh, I want you to go ahead and read. Uh, flip over to Haggai chapter 1 uh, and read verses 1 to 11. And you'll see uh, the beginning of the prophecy of the book of Haggai. If you stay there for a little bit and finish the two chapters of Haggai, you'll have read that book. But uh, you can stop at chapter 11. You'll get a sense of, of what that book entails. All right, so uh, really as Haggai is giving them this prophecy, he's preaching them a pretty harsh sermon. Um, you live in, in houses uh, and you have a place for yourself, but you haven't done what you came to do and build a house for the Lord. Um, and you're planting and you're, you're harvesting and you're reaping and you're sowing, but, but the yields are not what you would expect. Be and through the prophet Haggai, it says, because you have not honored me. And so the call is for them to rebuild the temple, and we see that's exactly what they do. Uh, the uh, returned exiles, they start rebuilding. Uh, this is in the second year of Darius, in the sixth month, uh, so that would be late summer. Um, and we might ask, as we're thinking about this, why does God want a house? Uh, does he need it? Uh, does it show something more? Um, well, I think there's two reasons. One, God promised that he, uh, his house would be rebuilt, and so God is going to keep his promise. Uh, but the second thing is, it's their, um, the, the struggle is, is, is uh, they're valuing their own things above the things of God. This is a, a first commandment issue. Uh, they fear the, the surrounding peoples more than they fear God. They, they trust in their own produce more than they trust in God. They, they uh, love their own things more than they love God. So there's a variety of reasons there. Um, God wants him, them to turn to him in times of struggle not to themselves because if you remember back um, when David first had the idea to build a house for the Lord um, 
because uh, he said, I'm dwelling in a palace and, and the ark of the God is in a tent. And so um, he, the prophet Nathan says, yeah, go do whatever is in your heart. And uh, before Nathan can get out of the courtyard, God tells Nathan the prophet to go back to David and said, tell him, would you build me a house? No, I'll build you a house. Um, and one of your descendants will sit on my throne forever and one of your descendants, he will build me a house. And so that had its near fulfillment in Solomon who built that first temple, which was grand and majestic, but has its greater fulfillment in Christ who does sit on the throne of David, God's king over us forever. And who is the one who had the, his body, his temple destroyed. And in three days, he built it up again. He built the greater temple. So we do see that there. Um, but here, this is the, what God had promised. It's the place where God shows his love, his mercy, and grace. All right, so go ahead and read Ezra chapter 5, verses 3 through 5. All right, so we see that uh, as they're building, uh, it raises the um, interest of the Persian officials, the governors and the other officials. Um, and they come and they ask two things. Who authorized this and who's in charge, right? Because this is now... Um, we know Cyrus the Great authorized it, but then his son Cambysius was a ruler after that, and then after that was um, was um, was then Darius. And so it's very likely that these governors changed multiple times. They would not have been aware of Cyrus's first decree. Um, and so as they go into this, as they get their response from these Jewish leaders, um, God's hand is on them. His eye is on them and it looks favorably upon them um, and allows them to build even while that inquiry set all the way back um, to King Darius and they wait for his return. All right, so go ahead and read Ezra chapter 5 verses 6 through 17. Uh, this is the report uh, that they give to uh, King Darius um, as they are asking about what they should do with this matter of the building in Jerusalem. All right, so they report to the king that a temple's being built, and they're saying it's being built efficiently and well. So basically, they're saying, if you want to stop it or have us change this, you need to act immediately. But the summary of their conversation uh, with the Jews in Jerusalem is what is in this letter. Uh, it includes their, um, the, how they asked by what authority they were building, and the Jews giving the history, including their unfaithfulness to God, and the temple's destruction by Nebuchadnezzar. It talks about the return that was authorized by Cyrus the Great under Sheshbazar and how the temple uh, was to be built and even um, um, the temple items were returned there as well. Uh, but through this, we, we see it in the, the answer of these uh, Jewish exiles returned uh, in their answer how God is in control. Um, God is the one who allowed the Nebuchadnezzar to destroy the temple. It wasn't because of Nebuchadnezzar's might or because his gods were more powerful, but it was because of Israel's disobedience. And, and then the God in being in control to, to punish him, to try to bring his people back to him. Um, and so now even it's reconstruction and restoration. Yes, under Cyrus's authority, but ultimately under God's, as he is the one in control of history. Um, and so... That's what's going on. We hear about Sheshbazar laying the foundation, how the work is going on. And they ask that this, a search would be made in the records. All right. And go ahead and read for us, Ezra. Go ahead and read for yourself, uh, Ezra chapter 6, uh, verses 1 through 5. All right. So here, uh, Darius finds a record from Cyrus that's consistent with the story of the Jews. Um, and so... Um, they're allowed to, yeah, so that's what's going on. So this is the first part of Cyrus's letter back to them. When we hear about the province beyond the river, um, when we think about that, that's from the Persian perspective. So uh, you think of Babylon, the Syria, on the, the Euphrates and the Tigris River. Susa's even a little farther to the east, the Persian capital of the Persian Empire. Um, so anything beyond the river Euphrates, or Euphrates is that beyond the river. And so this would include like, modern-day Syria and Israel and Jordan and Lebanon. Uh, that's the province beyond the river. Um, and so they, they search for this. They actually don't find it in Babylon or even in Susa. They find this record um, in the summer home of the Persian kings. And so uh, this was an extensive search that uh, the Darius makes. 
All right, go ahead and read the, the last part of his letter there, uh, 6 through 12 of chapter 6. So King Darius, in response to reading Cyrus's letter, or first command, um, he says, let them rebuild. Provide for the building and for the sacrifices. He says, uh, as they provide for the sacrifices, instruct them to pray for the king and his sons. Um, he tells the... Um, and then he says, there's a warning at the end of it that if anyone would uh, try to disrupt them or stop them, that a beam should be pulled from his house. Basically, his house should be destroyed and the person be impaled upon it. Um, and so pretty serious warning. So this is typical uh, in these Persian um, kings uh, and their responses. I uh, see the Persian kings, um, different from the Babylonian and Assyrian kings before them, um, the Persian kings... Um, were well versed in the religions of the people of their empire and they would encourage them in fact the, the policy is that they can go rebuild those structures and do that worship the right way so they researched the right way to do that they they talked to the people of that culture to make sure that they could um, enact and have that worship done in the right way so they did the same here with the jews and even the dimensions of what's needed the daily sacrifices all of those things um, to, to make sure they're in line. Now, the interesting thing, it's 60 cubits by 60 cubits high. Um, it doesn't give the third measurement, right? You have a height, you have height, but you don't have width and um, depth. Um, so um, the, the length of the temple was 60 cubits long. Uh, the width was only 20 and the height was 30. So here's, there's a discrepancy. Um, not sure if that's a later scribal error, or if it's an error um, in this part of this um, Aramaic letter that uh, was an error. Uh, but either way, um, they had done their research and their homework, and so even to the point of prescribing the size of the temple. Um, so that's going on, um, and, and Darius gives warnings that any who oppose should rebuild. Uh, interesting there, he asks them to pray for the king and his sons. Uh, this should not have be a problem for the Jews. Um, not because they bribed, because he bribed them to do it by providing all this stuff, but because um, they were to pray for rulers and those in authority. Um, in the fourth, and that continued in the New Testament, right? In the, the fourth petition of the Lord's Prayer, it says, give us this day our daily bread. Uh, Martin Luther talked about how um, that included peace and prosperity in our lands because of good leaders so that we could produce things well and have our daily bread as we need it. Paul talks about how we should pray for authorities as well in his writings. And so um, this is in line with what God calls for us to do uh, within his church. All right, um, go ahead and read Ezra chapter six, verses 13 through 18. Right, we see that the temple is completed. It's the sixth year of Darius. It's been almost 20 years after the foundations were laid in King Cyrus's time. We know this is uh, March 12th of 515 BC because it gives us the, the date uh, that's there. Almost four and a half years after the, po uh, the prophetic work of Haggai began and then Zechariah continued it. Um, and we see it's finished as the result of two decrees. Um, did you catch that? The first one is the decree from God himself. And the second decree is the decree by the Persian kings. It's not the decrees of the Persian kings. It's the decree of the Persian kings. It's a singular decree. Cyrus, Darius I, Artaxerxes, one royal decree reinforces that God himself is the one acting and moving through these Persian rulers. Uh, and you might find it interesting that Artaxerxes is mentioned, right? Because it was under Cyrus that the first um, decree was given that the Jews could return home and rebuild. Um, it paused um, under his rule and continued paused under the rule of his son, Cambysius. And then King Darius here gives the decree that it should be finished and the, all of the, the money sh uh, for it should be paid out of the treasury. Um, and then it's completed uh, during the reign of King Darius. And, and then you're like, well, why is Artaxerxes included? Um, and so that goes back to something we talked about a little bit last week. Uh, beginning in chapter 4, uh, I think verse 6 or 7, um, the, in the original, it, it changed from Hebrew at that point to Aramaic. And it continues in Aramaic all the way to verse 18 of chapter 6. In verse 19, it goes back to Greek. And so this seems to be one larger 
a unit writing a report um, that that the the writer the author of Ezra uh, kind of places in his uh, in the midst of his book to detail the the opposition um, to the building of the temple and to Jerusalem itself with its wall and other things um, but also how God is faithful and works through these rulers uh, you might say well why is this report first crafted uh, to begin with um, some have suggested that Nehemiah uh, who was um, some 50 years after the temple was completed uh, was the one who maybe commissioned this report or made this report and in it he goes and details all of the history um, from his period of time when Artaxerxes is king going back all the way to Cyrus um, and this, so this details these um, this Aramaic report with the copies of two letters to two different kings and their responses and some of the other history in between it details um, the, the conflict and the struggle and the, the history that happened between um, the Jewish leaders, the surrounding peoples and governors, and through the kings of Persia. And so that explains why there's this weird time sense, if you will, um, because we were, we're in the reign of Cyrus and we jump to a letter to King Artaxerxes, right? That's the beginning of the report because if it's written during its, his time, if you're looking for all of these um, writings, letters, things that have to do with Jerusalem and the Persian kings, if you're going back through the records, you start at the earliest date and you work back towards the later dates, the older dates. Um, and so the, they started closer to their time period. They ran across that correspondence between Artaxerxes um, in chapter 4, uh, where he says, stop the rebuilding in Jerusalem. And then as you go more through the records, you flip farther back through the records of the kings, you find this record under Darius, which references the earlier, um, uh, re earlier order under King Cyrus. And so the goal of that writing would have been to convince King Artaxerxes to help with the rebuilding effort in Jerusalem. And, and so it is 50 years later, and we're going to find out as we continue reading, um, that after 50 years, the temple needs some refurbishment, and there's some other things that are needed in Jerusalem as well. And Artaxerxes, he does flip his, uh, his he flips his decision, his policy towards Jerusalem after uh, this report, it seems, and he does help the rebuilding efforts in Jerusalem, including the, the refurbishment of the temple. And so it's fitting, I guess, here then, that the temple is rebuilt, yes, under the reigns of King Cyrus and King Darius, but then later refurbished under King Artaxerxes. All right, so hopefully that wasn't too convoluted or, or kind of confusing, but this whole um, chapters, most of chapters four through six, it's one uh, kind of Aramaic unit. It's even written in a different language in the originals. Um, and then it switches back to Hebrew here uh, for the last part, for Hebrew or Ezra chapter six, verses 19 through 22. So I'm gonna go ahead and have you read that, uh, those verses, and then we'll come back and finish this up. Uh, so to bookend uh, so to bookend this rebuilding of the temple just as when they built the altar they celebrated the festival of booze when they built the temple the next festival that they celebrated about a month and a half later uh, would have been the passover and that was on april 21st of 515 bc and not that they weren't celebrating the passover after they'd returned but it's it's like the first time you've have a worship service after your church is built and then the first time you have an Easter after your church service is built that's a big deal that's what's going on here with with Passover um, they're celebrating that it's uh, Passover is the first day of the festival but it lasted a whole week uh, it was also called the uh, Feast of Unleavened Bread that was what lasted the rest of the week um, and everyone who returns from exile eats of it it says but they're also faithful Judeans and other foreigners who had uh, stayed behind that were incorporated in the community of believers. Uh, so you notice uh, earlier in, when they were building the temple, there were enemies of, of Benjamin and Judah and the, the returned exiles um, who tried to, to thwart their efforts. But there were um, some faithful ones who weren't worshiping Yahweh and other gods. They were only worshiping Yahweh. They separated themselves from the other peoples. They're part of the community. Uh, they're allowed to worship and to partake in these great feasts and festivals as well. All right, so we see here how God fulfills his promises spoken through the prophets, um, how he's in control. He uses Persian kings 
and rulers and governors and officials. Uh, he uses his prophets and, and calls uh, people to, to speak his word to his people. He uses leaders of the people. He uses the people themselves. He uses the record keeping that went on uh, and then able to, to find and uh, um, those records of what happened. God uses all of these things to fulfill his word spoken through this prophets that they would return to Jerusalem, that they would rebuild the temple. He's in control. Um, and, and so while during those 12 years, it might have seemed like God forsook the, his people, um, he fulfills his word. And they're to be patient and, and trust that God will give them victory. Uh, and they do. And that's the same for us today, too. As we see God's faithfulness to these Judean exiles, we know that God will give us victory through Jesus. Now, it doesn't always happen in the time and in the way that we want it. It didn't necessarily for the Judean exiles, but God is faithful. He keeps his promises. Uh, he's there for you. He loves you um, through Jesus, who is that new and greater temple, who is the, the greatest and last sacrifice. Jesus is the one through whom God keeps all his promises. And yet those promises still to, to be completely fulfilled, we know God will keep them to us because he's kept them to all of his people leading up to us. And so God is faithful. God is true. In spite of the people's unfaithfulness, God keeps his word. Well, thanks for being with us today as we studied and, and looked at Ezra's chapter 5 and 6. Next week, we'll continue with Ezra chapter 7 and 8. God's blessings to you. Uh, just trust in the Lord and his faithfulness.